I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. Uh, we're continuing our Just Jesus series, looking at the life of Christ, uh, and uh, we're in that, ser- that season of Easter, so we're looking at the resurrection, the crucifixion today. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, there's some in the pews around you, look like this, turn to page 1,124 and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And adversity doesn't create character as much as it reveals character. And, uh, and when we look at the cross, we see the most transparent moments in Jesus' life. Uh, because you can't fake it in the pain. He's there, he's hurting, and and. We see Jesus and his character revealed in this most difficult part of his journey. And today, as we look at Jesus' character on the cross, I really want you to to wrestle with the question, what comes out of my life when I'm under pressure? What is it that is revealed in me at the most difficult parts of the journey? Because with Jesus, we begin by seeing a request for mercy. A request for mercy. Verse 34 of Luke 23 and says simply, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, Jesus prays for his tormentors, his accusers, the, the, the people who have railroaded him, who are inflicting the pain. And I don't know about you, but it sure seems like they knew what they were doing. Right, Because you had the Roman soldiers who were experts at crucifixion. They were uh, you know, trained in how to inflict pain, how to make it torturous for people to die. And, and these guys were the crucifixion detail. And so they were taking out their anger, their frustration, their animosity on the victims. Whether they were guilty or innocent, they didn't care. And the priests knew what they were doing. They came out to mock Jesus and to say, hey, you, know, you saved others. Why don't you save yourself? If you really are the Messiah, come down off the cross and we'll believe in you. And yet these were the same men who had railroaded Jesus, who had lied about him to Pilate, who had paid people to betray him and to say false things about him. They knew that Jesus was innocent, and yet they still mocked him. And in the midst of that, Jesus forgives them. Jesus forgives them. Um, when somebody hurts you, what's your natural reaction to that? Yeah, you want to hurt them back, don't you? I mean, that's our, our, just our flesh reaction. You know, our, our natural reaction, at least mine, is not uh, compassion. I mean, somebody hurts me, I'm not thinking, oh, you poor soul, you must be in so much pain to hurt me. I'm not trying to understand the why. I'm not grieving their pain. I'm just thinking, you hurt me. See, when someone hurts me, uh, especially if it's unjust, unjustly, I, I want vengeance, you know, or at least, uh, you know, justice to be done, but not Jesus. He asks for mercy for the people who are tormenting him, and he leads us in example by giving mercy. You see, Jesus calls us to be merciful. First of all, he wants every one of us to receive mercy. He wants us to be forgiven. That's why he died. Because Jesus' death paid for our sins. When he he suffered on the cross, he was dying for you and for me. And, And by the way, when he prayed, Father, forgive them, he was praying for us as well. Because we know what we're doing when we're angry. We know what we're doing when we're proud. You know, we know that our gluttony and our greed are wrong, that our laziness and our lust are an abomination to God. And yet we still do those things. And Jesus suffered and died on the cross so that our sins, your sins, my sins, could be forgiven and washed away by his shed blood. So Jesus wants us to be forgiven. By the way, the only reason that we have forgiveness is Jesus. Uh, And to receive that forgiveness, you have to believe, you have to follow Jesus. So have you taken that step? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? That you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and that he actually was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life? 
If so, then you are forgiven. You have received mercy. So Jesus shows us how to give grace, be merciful, and to receive mercy. Let me ask you a question, and I hope this question kind of haunts you all week long. Do you delight in grace? Do you delight in grace? Now, the easy answer to that is yes, of course we delight in grace because all of us want to be forgiven, right? We all want mercy. When we mess up, we want someone to, to be gracious towards us because somehow inside of us, we feel like, hey, we, we meant well, we just made, we just, you know, made a mistake, right? Because uh, I, I, you know, I'm quick to ask for mercy, you know, especially when some of our local law enforcement pull us over <laughs> like the officer from the 930 service did for me the other day. Uh, and... Uh, you know, and, and so he shows up at my window and I'm asking for mercy. I'm like, hey, you know, I know it's wrong, but can I have grace here? And, and I delight in mercy. I like receiving mercy. We all do. But here's the thing. You love receiving mercy. Do you enjoy giving mercy to others? Or do you prefer to sit in judgment, in condemnation? James chapter 2, verse 13 has a great warning for us. It says, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy beats judgment. Isn't that awesome? So do we delight in grace? You know, churches are, are great at talking about grace. We talk about forgiveness all the time, but we're not always great at being merciful. I mean, we know that God is merciful, but sometimes we give grace like it's in short supply, like it's water in California and we have to ration it. It's not your day for mercy, it's their day for mercy. Or we break out a, a you know, like a, an eyedropper, you know, and put a little bit of mercy in it and say, okay, this is all we have for you, just a little bit. But that's not Jesus. Jesus is lavish with grace. He just spreads it out all over, spills it all over people. He doesn't care because he knows that God is not going to run out of forgiveness. That his shed blood on the cross was enough to pay for all of our sins. And so he's, he's generous with grace and he wants us to be generous with grace. Because forgiven people forgive. So I ask... How would your life change if you were more generous with grace? How would your marriage be different if you were more generous with grace? Okay, guys, if you woke up in the morning and before you put your feet on the floor, you prayed, Father, forgive her, for she knows not what she's doing. <laughs> Ladies, if, if you prayed, Father, forgive him, you know he's an idiot, uh, you know, what, what if we actually decided in advance, hey, God, I want to be gracious towards my spouse. I want to be loving toward them. I, I want to forgive them before they offend me. How would that change the conversation in your relationship? How would that change the conflict in your relationship? See, I, I'm guessing it would make it better. What about with our kids? You know, parents, you know, what if you brought more mercy into your family with regards to your children? And, and some of the parents right now say, nope. I'm the judge, I'm the jury, I'm the executioner with the kids. It's my job to keep them in line and I'm gonna live that out. You know, it's interesting as the Bible says there's one lawgiver and one judge and it's not you. It's Jesus. And maybe our job as parents is to lead our children to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, show them what it looks like in our own lives and raise them up to be responsible, wise adults not to be the one who judges them and criticizes them and condemns them every time they make a mistake. How would your life change if you were more generous with grace with your coworkers, with your friends, even with your enemies? See, when life squeezes you, do you ooze mercy or is judgment what comes out? You see, they squeezed Jesus and mercy flowed. Second thing we see on the cross is the promise of hope. The promise of hope. Verse 43, and Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, there are two thieves crucified with Jesus. 
two totally different attitudes. One of them is attacking Jesus. Hey, Jesus, save yourself, and while you're at it, save us too. He's joining in the mockery with the crowds and the priests. And the other thief, he, he kind of rebukes his partner in crime. He says, hey, we're getting what we deserve, but this man, he's innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. And then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Remember me. I want your grace. I want your mercy. And Jesus responds with the promise of hope. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now that is an amazing picture of grace, isn't it? I mean, here's a guy who's deserving of death in his own words, and yet he is forgiven and he does absolutely nothing to receive the grace. He just asks for it. Let that sink in for a moment. He doesn't do anything good. He doesn't go to church. He doesn't give an offering. He doesn't help out with anything. He just asks Jesus to forgive him. Jesus does, and then the man dies. So if you're sitting here and you're feeling guilty and you're thinking, well, I, I've done too much wrong. I can't be forgiven. I can't do enough right things. I don't know what I'm gonna, I, I just should understand something. First of all, none of us is deserving of grace. None of us deserves to be forgiven. Hey, look, we're all guilty, we're all in that same place. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. God offers you forgiveness when you ask. That is amazing grace. And I just remind you again, God is generous with grace. Now, the second picture that is here is that Jesus gives this dying man hope beyond this world. I mean, he says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, I know some church people, because I, I grew up in church and hung out with them, that wanted to argue about what paradise meant versus what heaven means, and is it the same place or a different place, and all this kind of stuff. And I listened to those arguments, and I thought, how stupid. How ridiculous. Come on, does it matter? I want you to think about this. Um, first of all, paradise doesn't sound bad to me. Does it sound bad to any of you guys? <laughs> paradise kind of sounds like, I don't know, Paradise. So uh, it's a good place. But here's the real kicker. He says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. In other words, Jesus says, hey, we're going to hang out later. When we're both dead, it's going to be good. You're going to be with me. And here's the thing. When I die, I want to be with Jesus. That's where I want to be. Because he's going to take care of me. He took care of me on the cross. He's going to take care of me in eternity. So I want to be with Jesus. And it doesn't matter where that is. It doesn't matter what you call it. Call it Baus for all I care. Hey, look, Jesus can make Baus look good, too, so I'm not worried about that. <laughs> see, see, that's just it. it, it it's with Jesus. And, and the main thing is we have hope beyond this world. That's the good news of the gospel, that we don't have to be afraid. So are you living in the promise? Are you living in the promise? If you've confessed Jesus as Lord, are you living with a strong conviction about eternity? Are you comfortable with the idea that one day you'll be with Jesus? Do you live knowing that your destiny is sealed and nothing in this world can separate you from Christ? See, I can't help but believe that the thief died with a whole different attitude that day. I mean, what began as a day where, where he was hopeless and, and looking at his final destiny in this world and suddenly he is a man who is filled with hope and he has a different attitude on the cross. I believe that the pain wasn't nearly as bad after that. I believe that, that he died with an expectation that it's going to get better because Jesus said, you're gonna be with me in paradise. It changed his attitude. It changed his outlook. You see, when we, when we live in the promise of eternity, it changes our attitude and it challenges our fears. Satan loves to use fear against us as a weapon. He just wants to hold you captive to your fears. And, and our culture is complicit with him because if you look around, you see a culture that is obsessed with fear, especially the fear of death, right? That's why nowadays, you know, your kids have to be in a car seat until they're 22, and there's a lot of you who grew up and your car seat when you were growing up was your mom going like this. <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're afraid of death. We've got to protect them. We have these constant warnings that everything that tastes remotely good is going to kill us. Right? Can't eat that. It's going to kill you. Can't eat that. We're, and they tell us we're so unhealthy. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm just kind of a facts guy. If we're so unhealthy and everything we're going to eat is going to kill us, then why are we actually living longer? 
right? They always talk about, well, you know, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, they lived healthy lives. Yes, and they died at 55. <laughs> you know, we're, we're blowing way past that, going, yeah, we're so unhealthy, but we're living longer. I, it doesn't make sense to me. And there's this never-ending search for longer life. They're doing all this research. We're gonna break the code of aging. We're gonna stop that so you can live forever. No, we're not. We're not. Besides, what's the point of living longer if you're still trapped by your fears? It's different with Jesus. It's different for the followers of Jesus. We don't have to fear death. Jesus beat death. We can live boldly, courageously, fearlessly with a purpose for Christ. So today, where's your hope? Is it in this world or is it in the promise of life in Jesus? And when life pressures you, what's revealed? Hope or fear? Because when life pressed Jesus, he exuded hope. Finally, in this passage, you see a cry of trust. Verse 46. Then Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus trusted his father with his life, with his pain, with his plan, with his death. Now, you might think, well, of course, he was Jesus. He's going to trust the father. But do you remember just hours before this, he was in the garden and he was praying to the father and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, Father, I don't want to die. I don't want the pain. I don't want to go this route. Can't we do this another way? Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. So Jesus trusted the Father at the moment of death. He declared his faith in him. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, my life, my everything. So are you going to walk in faith when you can't see the way? We walk in faith. When you can't see where God's leading, or, or even better, when you know God's leading you to pain. Because God wants us to trust him. Scriptures tell us without faith it is impossible to please God. And so God wants you to trust him. And he starts off asking you to trust him with the little things. Because when you learn to trust God with the little things, then you know that you can trust him with the big things. That's why uh, seemingly less important you know, points of obedience are really important. Because as we learn to trust God in the, the small moments of life, when the trials and tragedies come, We're going to be able to trust God then. And God wants to grow our faith through those acts of obedience over and over and over again in our life. So will you walk in faith? Especially when you don't know where God's leading you or how God's going to redeem you. It all begins by trusting God with next. Next. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then I know that God the Holy Spirit lives in you. And God the Holy Spirit is your teacher and he's the one who convicts you of sin and leads you to truth. So what that means is is right now I know as I ask you, are you going to trust God with next, that the Holy Spirit is prompting you. And maybe he's prompting you saying, hey, I want you to obey at this point. I want you to do this command that, that we've been talking about. Or maybe he's saying, hey, I want you to break this habit that's destroying your life. Or maybe he's saying, I've got a mission for you, and I want you to serve me in this way. I want you to go to this person. I want you to invite them to come to church, to come to Christ. What I do know is this. The Holy Spirit is talking to us, and he wants us to obey at next. And if we take that next act of obedience, it's so important because at some point, like Jesus, we're going to have to trust God at the point of death. At the point of death. We want to be at peace. We want to be able to trust God in that moment. And if we're going to trust God in that huge moment of death, then we're going to need to trust God in the moments along the way, every single day, until we get to that point. Because then we'll boldly be able to say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So will you trust God with your marriage, with your children, with your family? We trust God with your education, with your career, with your money. We trust God with your fears and your pain 
and your failures and even your death. You see, Jesus died with a shout of trust on his lips. Will you live your life expressing your faith in God moment by moment? So when the pressures of life get to you, do people see your faith or do they see your doubts? What comes out of your life when you're under pressure? With Jesus, he revealed mercy and hope and trust. We're the people of God. Are we revealing the character of Christ in our lives, especially at the most difficult times? In just a moment, we're going to continue worshiping and we're going to celebrate communion. And communion is a time when uh, we reflect on what Jesus has done for us and we say thank you to him for the sacrifice that he's given us. And I want to challenge you today as we celebrate communion. I, in fact, I want to dare you. Will you ask God to change you on the inside so that whatever comes out looks like Jesus? Let's pray.